very pleased that so many of our members are able to join us this evening. Our speaker today is Corey Wilkins, the Western Regional Director of the Archaeological Conservancy. Corey is retired from the U.S. Coast Guard and served as the director of a California land trust. He has been with the Archaeological Conservancy for 10 years, where he leads acquisition projects and oversees the management of numerous preserves on the West Coast. Corey lives in Reno, Nevada. Corey. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. So greetings from blustery Nevada. We had 50 mile an hour winds last night, but uh, hopefully that will not affect our, our presentation this evening. So welcome. Tonight we're not gonna talk about Nevada, we're gonna talk about California and some of our sites that we have there. Um, first, a little bit about the Conservancy, uh, our history. We were established in 1980, and we're the only nation or national nonprofit organization ded dedicated to acquiring and preserving the best of our nation's remaining archaeological sites on private lands. TAC is governed by a 12-person board of directors. The objectives of the Conservancy are to identify the most important endangered sites in the United States, acquire the property by donation, purchase at fair market value or bargain sale to charity. Bargain sale to charity is, is a, uh, that's a combination of donation and sale. So the, the owner or would, would agree to uh, a value or a price on the property that's less than fair market value. Secure the property and stabilize the cultural resources in situ. Manage the preserve as part of a long-term plan. And educate the general public and local officials about destruction of cultural resources and how we can preserve what remains. As you have met Mark, he's our president and one of the, one of the co-founders of the Conservancy. So our, our, as most of you probably know, our headquarters office is in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Out of Albuquerque, they do all of our grant, most of our grant writing and funding. We do work with with Sarah on a lot of those things out of the uh, regional offices. Our membership business is, is directed out of Albuquerque Business Administration, uh, the production of American Archaeology Magazine, uh, the supervision of the regional offices, offices is done out of Albuquerque. It's the office for our Southwest region. And website and social media development is, is done out of Albuquerque. This is, is very important to us as regional directors because these guys lighten our load so much that we're able to really focus on, on what we need to do, and that's researching and acquiring these sites. Um, with, with this support staff, it's, it's, a, it's just a joy to be able to go out and, and do what we do, knowing that they're behind us uh, completing these other tasks. We are divided into five regions, Western, Southwestern, Midwestern, Southeastern, and Eastern. As you can see, I'm here in the West. Reno's right here. I've got Nevada, California, Washington, Idaho, and Oregon. So our regional staff consists of a regional director and a field representative. And usually one of these two is going to be an archeologist. I am not, so I depend on, on archaeologists for my technical work. We, we sometimes employ interns. We have a lot of volunteer site stewards at our sites. I'll talk a little bit more about that coming up. And a lot of volunteer maintenance personnel. Our regional duties out of, out of the regional offices, identify and evaluate sites get board of directors support for our projects, pursue complete acquisitions from, from the initial phase of research to, to uh, property closing, purchase or donation, and maintain uh, and steward our preserves. So we do everything from buying property to fixing fences, everything in between. Um, this picture here is pretty interesting. This is, this is a picture of a, a, a replicated roundhouse 
um, or dance house, and that's at Grinding Rocks State Park in California. So why do we do this? Why bother to preserve these sites? The ancient people of North America made no written records of their cultures. For us to gain understanding of what happened here, we, we rely on clues left behind by these early Americans. This is very important. Over the past few decades, the knowledge techniques and methods of modern archaeology, archaeologists have, have advanced tremendously. Few of the technologies used today existed 50 years ago. For this reason, it's important that we keep a significant portion of raw data in the ground for future research. Great. Examples of that are, are uh, LIDAR, ground penetrating radar. So what is our criteria? Importance is first. Eval excuse me. Evaluate the, the intrinsic importance of these sites. How many equivalent sites are left? Is How rare is the site? Does the site have long-term research potential? Is it eligible for the National Register of, of Historic Places? Degree of endangerment, how long will it last? Is it, is it uh, subject to, to, to destruction by either agriculture, development, or some other means? Is the site likely, likely to rise in price? Should we grab it now while we can? Availability, the owner willing to, to work with us? Does it fit with our knowledge and plans? Logistics, is it in our area of operations, which is, is the lower 48? Uh, are there other sites in the area that we can be working on? We do have clusters of sites in, in areas, so that's nice to, to work those areas um, at, all at once, those sites all at once. How easy is it to get to? Um, as you, I'm sure you know, some archaeological sites are, especially in the West, are way off the beaten path. Uh, they might not need the protection um, that some other sites would need. How difficult is the project and time consuming? and how difficult is permanent site management? These are all things we have to look at. And finally, funding, how difficult is it gonna to be to fund this thing? Uh, possibilities of transfer, that would mean, uh, can we get our money back by, by selling the, the property eventually to say California State Parks or Nevada State Parks or uh, Bureau of Land Management or somebody else who would take permanent ownership of the site and, and be responsible for it. And then publicity responsibilities, we have, we have many sites that are, they have, we have signage, uh, kiosks, we, we run tours on our sites, which helps us to, to really promote what we do as well as the importance of these archeological sites and, and why we preserve them. We currently over, have over 550 preserves across 45 states. Our California sites, we have 23 that I, I manage. We've transferred four uh, sites to federal and state agencies. And currently I'm working on, and this number varies constantly, but over 90 projects in various stages of acquisition. And, and I'm sure the other regional directors have similar lists. Uh, it's everything from a great idea to things that are, are getting ready to close and everything in between. So the first thing I want to talk about today is uh, Wales or Wales Triangle, we call it, and that is down here outside of Cambria, or it's in Cambria, California, north of Santa Barbara. It's apparently 8,000 years old, 8,400. Uh, we started purchasing these lots uh, where the site is in 2000 with uh, Green Space, which is the local land trust. So this is this is one of the lots. We currently own four parcels, and I think there are two left that we're trying to get. And every time they come available, Green Space calls me. We work the acquisition together. It's a great partnership. Um, it's very interesting in in uh, Cambria. You have in order to build on a piece of property, you have to have a water meter, and the the wait for a watt for water meter rights is I think it's twenty years or more. So essentially, there are a lot of people that own lots like this that can't do anything with them. So it makes sense for them knowing if they're if they're interested in in preserving the cultural resource, uh, we can buy it at fair market value, and and it's a it's usually a good deal for them if if they don't want to wait 20 years for a, a water meter. 
this is another picture from the site. Uh, it's a it's a large coastal prehistoric village site. It's dominated by thick black midden, and on the surface you'll find shell, bone, and lithic material. As you can see, it's a it's a large site. Uh, Stanford University excavated part of the site in, in 1976, and dated occupation over 8,400 8, years ago, as diagnosed by projectile point. This is our neighbor looking at our tree. Um, we do a lot of maintenance on our sites. We spend a lot of money to mow grass and trim trees, and you can imagine 500 and, and over 550 sites across the country. We have, you know, for, like I said, constantly fixing fences, mowing yards, um, uh, you name it. Um, this is our neighbor. We we met and discussed how how we wanted to trim this tree, and and it's really it's very important to us that we be good neighbors. Uh, we partner with Green with Green Space to pay property taxes. <clears throat> excuse me, facilitate maintenance uh, and facilitate maintenance of the Wales Preserve. Uh, we rely heavily on green space and other land trusts across the country to lead us to new projects in our regions. It has been a great pleasure to partner and collaborate with green space on preserving and maintaining wells or whales. Sorry. So again, this is our neighbor green space and TAC work with our neighboring property owner to keep the site pristine and preserved. Neighbors acting as site stewards greatly enhance the security and stability of TAC preserves. And this is this is very important for me and in, in my position. I have neighbors, we, we have a lot of sites in neighborhoods, and I have neighbors that have my email address, they have my phone number. If they see something suspicious, they can call me. If somebody comes in and does maintenance, they they tell me that it looks good. So it, it cuts down my time and having to actually visit sites a lot if I have these, these, uh, these neighbors really looking out for our best interests. Our next one is, is the Lannan Ranch. This is uh, 7,000 years before present. It's a 1600 acre ranch that was donated to us in 1998 by Mrs. Belville Lannan. And as you can see by the star, it's in Southern California, just north of Los Angeles, um, fairly close to um, uh, Palmdale. This is a picture of the ranch in the spring, beautiful place. You wouldn't know you were that close to Los Angeles. Uh, like I said, pristine 1600 acre, acre ranch. This is with wildflowers just a beautiful place and during research they found that the Lana ranch contains one of the very few inland soapstone quarries in california other quarries are located in the channel islands and in the palmdale area which again is close uh, soapstone was was widely traded and sourceable therefore the archaeological deposits on the property form the basis for theories on trade from southern california inland to this to the southwest Finished soapstone artifacts and various stages of manufacture were found on the ranch. Surfer surveys reveal, ma reveal many artifacts on the ranch, including bedrock mortars, cupules, lithics, ceramics, and groundstone. And you can see on the rock here, these, these are what we call cupules, these small, um, they're not quite bedrock mortars. They weren't used to process food. But the the leading theory is that they were used for more of a, a fertility type uh, ritual. In Agua Dulce, they're they, they're still filming a lot of westerns and other things. Uh, this this picture down here is from Vasquez Rocks. Uh, a lot of things have been filmed out there. This is really close to our ranch. Um, this is one scene that I picked because it's. Pretty famous from the Star Trek series. Um, the people that do filming on, on our ranch that have the rights to our ranch, and they they film away from the archaeological sites, uh, is Caravan West. And this is an actual scene from one of their, their films that they did on our ranch. Next stop is Lathrop Mound, and this is just south of Sacramento. It's uh, 1,500 plus years before presence, a small one, two, uh, 2.1 acres. And this is an, a unique uh, site because we actually lease this. It's a year-to-year -year lease from the Union Pacific Railroad. 
Again, it's a, it's a small mound. You can see the contour here, um, 1.5 meters high, and in can't see that because of my head's in the way. In 1993, uh, Far Western Anthropological conducted a survey, and they found olivella and, and clam disc. Olivella is a is a shell type, and clam clam disc beads, a bear claw, several points and bifaces, and human bones. So if you see in the background here. There's a development. That development is steadily moving this direction towards the mound. So this is this is what I was talking about when we when we do an assessment of a property, how endangered it is. We know eventually that that this housing development will be right up against this mound. And unfortunately, the railroad only owns about two thirds. This is facing north, so the the southern two thirds of this mound. So it's going to be important, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I've tried, and the, the developer has gone out of business, and been, it's been picked up by the people. So, but I'm, I'm trying at, at, at present to get the remainder of this of this mound secured, so nothing happens to it in the future. Next is our Cary Ranch Preserve. It's 160 acres. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of research done there; just some surveys. So, the age has yet to be determined. Um, it's in Anza, California, as you can see down here, which is is uh, just kind of southwest from Palm Springs. And we acquired this through first it was an easement and then a fee donation, excuse me. So conservation easement is is something that is placed on the property that gives us the rights to we don't own the property, but it gives us the rights to to the archaeology, what happens to the archaeology? Um, it spells out certain things that can that can be done on the property as far as ground disturbance. Um, so again, we don't own the property, but we own a a, a right to the property, um, which is useful but not optimal because uh, with with uh, conservation easements comes um, some unique sets of of manage management problems. Anyway, this was this was originally an easement, and now is we own it outright. So this is the orientation. This is the border of the Cary Ranch here. The ranch house sits down here. This is all pasture. This, and you'll see in a minute, was Fred Clark Fred Clark's adobe, um, a, lith, a can scatter. Um, most of the Native Native American archaeology is through here. There was actually a Navy jet that crashed on the other side of the of the road here, and um the parts of the jet went across the road and into the field so that's what that blue circle is there so the timeline for the carry ranch and, and this is a this is a very unique property because it's very well documented except for how far the indian occupation goes back but as you can see the kuhia tribe occupied palki which is that's the the name of the uh of the village for several hundred centuries prior to contact. And then San Juan Batista came through and led two expeditions right through the, where the ranch is now in 1774 and 1775. Fred Clark purchased the property from the, from the Cahia tribe, or actually a Cahia Indian in 1916. And he ended up selling that to Art and Violet Carey, who purchased the ranch in 1938. And then Vincent Marianne Vernell purchased the ranch and donated the conservation easement in 2011, and then they donated the entire ranch to us in, in 2013. And Arden Carey's son, Richard Carey, is still active at the ranch. He does uh, all of our, our maintenance and he maintains the home and, and he's got a, obviously a vested interest in, in making sure the place is, is in good shape. So at Palki, excuse me, Again, we find more cupules, bedrock mortars. Here's the cup, the cupules, and cupules. A lot of times, we found on the sides of rocks, not on the tops, which is which is interesting. Um, the Cahia occupied the site for centuries before contact by the Spanish. This is this is not a great picture, but um, I didn't have really good stuff from from. The rock art on at the Cary Ranch, but these are some some small pictographs. 
This plaque was placed by the Native Sons of the Golden West in 1924, and it's on the property, uh, dedicating the the trip that Juan Batista Danza uh, made through the area. It says the first white explorers to cross the mountains and into California. Party traveled from Tubac, Mexico, to Monterey, California, on December 27, 75, on a second expedition to California. Anza led through this pass, the party of Spaniards from Sonora who became the founders of, of San Francisco. So this is this is where Danza ended up traveling through and what he what he he called San Carlos Pass was through here. Uh, the Pacific Ocean is is actually quite a ways on the other side, but they would have gone there and, and made a right turn and gone up to San Francisco, what is now San Francisco. This is Fred Clark's Adobe, 1920. And then when we when we first started visiting the property in 2011, this was all that was left. Um, that's that's still there. We probably need to get that covered. This is the Cary Ranch House, <clears throat> excuse me, built in between the 1930, well, 1940 ish. Um, Still standing today, all all hand built by Art Carey. Again, his son Richard is is our our steward and and ranch manager and and does a good job at at helping maintain buildings in there. So my the next property, the next preserve that I'd like to present is called the Fast Preserve. It's in Lassen County, way up north, just outside of Reading. Prehistoric, again, yet to be determined. Not, not a lot of uh, research has been done there. It's 160 acres and it was donated to us by three sisters. Very interesting site. So in August of 20, 2011, I got a call out of the blue by a, a really neat lady. Her name is Virginia Fast. She, lived in Chico, she lives in Chico, California. She called me and asked if we wanted a donation of property. Well. We we can't just accept donations of property unless there's archaeology on there, for obvious reasons. So, we I made arrangements arrangement with uh, Dr. Greg White, who did my technical work for me. Then he was out of, he had his own company called Subterra Consulting. He's a, a retired professor out of Chico State. Um, so we drove up, walked into the property. These are his two kids, which are amazing little archaeologists in themselves. Um, walked into the property so we could we could see if we could find archaeology and um, justify some sort of a donation. So as soon as we walked onto the property, we immediately began, we got across the, the property line, we immediately began picking up or, or finding artifacts. A lot of chipstone, um, this biface fragment, uh, just a, a lot of a, a lot of archaeology, especially by the spring that's on the property, and, and Greg had anticipated this. So at this site, this was about halfway into the property, found uh, a lithic scatter with evidence of midden right in this area. Uh, Dr. White believed it to be uh, an occupation site. He determined the, the fast property would lend itself well to future research with justified acceptance of the property. The Fast Sisters graciously donated the property to us in, in 2012. Subsequent to that, so what we saw, what we found was, was enough to justify the donation. But subsequent to that, uh, anthropology student from Chico State, Lowell Thomas, surveyed the, the Fast property for extra credit. He contacted us. He knew my field representative. We gave him permission and in he went. This is Lowell here, and that's his dad who is an amateur archaeologist as well. This is one of the rock rings they found and a point down here that they found. So we went from, in 2011, from not knowing if there's any archaeology on this thing and not even knowing if it was, if it was worth a donation to 2013, 2014. This is what Lowell found on the property. 72 rock rings, 11 house depressions, 36 rock stacks or alignments. Uh, they, those could be prehistoric or historic, uh, 65 ground stone, uh, either uh, matates or 
or bedrock mortars, 45 projectile points. Some of them were sitting in rock rings, uh, 25, 25 basalt cores and utilized flakes, four minute deposits, three petroglyph panels, one pictograph panel, um, some beads and lithic scatters and one rock shelter. So this, this property really turned out to be quite the gem for us. As you can see down here in the picture, this is one of, of the, the petroglyphs human human shape <coughs> excuse me next property is willis wells another very interesting property 2.6 acres 3000 years old um, and it was donated to us by the san bernardino county museum association they owned it they were having some problems with with people getting in so they uh they donated it to us. Again, it's down here, Southern California. We're back in the Southern California desert, just outside of Barstow. So the Chemway and, and Mojave tribes are reported to have occupied this site and used a freshwater spring, which is just off picture down here at the site. Service artifacts found include milling features, flakes, and pottery sherds. One thing to note, and I'll talk about this in, in a couple of slides forward from here is the thickness of these rock walls and the height. Those are, that's probably three to four feet thick. And that's, that's interesting. The petroglyphs are estimated to be 2,000 to 3,000 years old. Again, there's really no set way to, to date petroglyphs. Um, this is just an estimate from one of the archeologists that, that did a study there. Um, and because of the variety of styles in, a, in the rock art or, or petroglyphs at, at Willis Wells, well, archaeologists believe that different tribes occupied and used the area. More examples of, of petroglyphs at, at Willis. So this was something I found I thought it interesting just to include. Um, and I didn't notice this. I had, I had gone in and taken a bunch of pictures of the place. And, and when I was looking at them later, I noticed this inscription here. I, I assumed it was maybe just historical graffiti or, or something. But later on, I saw this three months. And just pure speculation on my part, I did, I did some research and I never found um, evidence of anybody ever being buried there at the site, uh, which I don't know if that type of thing would have been would have been recorded, but who knows? It could be could be some sort of a tombstone for for a, an infant. So these again, these rock walls that are that are extremely thick and 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 tall in some areas, they're four or five feet tall, were built by uh, Mildred Willis, who, occup who occupied the site with her husband, George, from 1915 to 1925. George lost the use of his right arm in a knife fight before they moved to the property, which left Mildred to do all of this work. And apparently she was not, not a, 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 a big woman. She was petite and fairly short, but she had to have been pretty tough to build all these things. So hats off to Mildred. Next site is Exeter Rocky Hill. And this, I have to say, is my absolute favorite site in my inventory. It's always a pleasure to go there. Um, and you'll see why. Uh, it's, it's near Exeter, California, uh, 2,000 years before present. It's 23 acres, and it was purchased in 1993. This site is also known as the, as the J.T. Last Archaeological Preserve. We dedicated this, this site to Dr. Last, who was, is one of the founders of the, of the Conservancy, uh, longtime board member. Uh, without him, there are a lot of things that would not have been possible, even maybe the existence of the Conservancy. So this was just a small token of our appreciation. This was the day we, we set the, the stone, so it's been cleaned up since then. <laughs> this is my, my site steward, Manuel Andrade. Manuel is an amazing guy. He, uh, he loves this, this preserve. 
uh, I think he's there more than he is at his own house. He he just he cares for for our property for this preserve like it's his own. And and quite honestly, I I, I give him carte blanche to do what he feels he needs to do there. These are a couple of our tour guides there. And uh, they, again, they do a great job. It's kind of a hands-off operation for me. Manuel takes care of everything. If he needs something, he calls. Um, it's, it's just a, a great arrangement. It's interesting, Bill is, is part of, of one of the tribes that historically used the area. And he did his rite of passage in, in one of the, the caves there. And it was very interesting to talk to him about that. So bedrock on the lower lower side of Rocky Hill, there are just tons of these bedrock mortars. You can see by the size of the, this pen that they're, they're very deep and, and large, uh, probably processing acorns. And also they actually process paint in some of these. There, there's a pigment in some of the bottoms of these bedrock mortars. So Rocky Hill is, is it consists of, of huge boulders stacked all over. You can see back here, they're just stacked all over each other. And underneath uh, many of these boulders are pictographs. You can't see this one, but this gentleman's taking a picture of one there. So when you get under some of these things, you'll find these, these pictographs, these paintings that are believed to have been done by the Yakuts people of the area identified by a common language, and that comes from Mary Gordon, who is a, an avocational archeologist. This is, they call the bear. Some of it's been, been washed away by, by water flow, but as you can see, it looks like a bear crawling into the cave. This is a very famous panel. You've already seen pictures of this <laughs> three or four times tonight. But there's a lot going on here. Down here at the bottom, call that the, the Condor Cape. Whether or not that's what it is, I don't know. Uh, humanoid figure there, apparently a male. This is the split head pictograph. You can see the head here with the red coming out. Very interesting. This one they call the birthing scene for obvious reasons. And up here, you can just see the bottom of a, a camel lid. Another panel in one of the other, we call them caves. They're not, they're not technically caves. They're the bottoms of these rocks, but it takes some maneuvering to get into some of these spaces. Looks like a turtle, who knows, large, large lizard. Um, Again, nobody really knows the meaning of these things. Um, hopefully someday we will. My next site is up just outside of San Francisco in the East Bay near Oakley, California. And it's the Hotchkiss Mound, another very important site. Uh, one of the last remaining, remaining um, Bay Area mounds that is relatively intact in the East Bay, mostly because of agriculture. More, most of them have been, have been leveled, plowed for, for years, and now they're getting built on. This is the Hodgkiss Mound. You can see the height here. It's probably 15 feet high, I would say at least, maybe higher, 20. You can see the adjacent house here, and we're almost at roof level there. It's a huge, massive site. It's excavated over four decades. Items found during, during these excavations, fish spears, mortars, pestles, projectile points, shell beads and ornaments, bird bone beads and whistles. This gentleman here is Dr. Elmer Jerkins. He did uh, some research, what, four or five years ago. He just went through, we have rodents at, at these sites, and he just went through where the rodents had dug up, dug up, you might be able to see it here, had dug up some, some of the, the earth 
collected that, took it back, and did some of the following research. Uh, some bone typology, and this was done prior to him, but the animal ceremonialism, ceremonialism bone fossilization, bioarchaeology, he did that, shell typology, uh, cultural chronology, radiocarbon dating, and, and obsidian hydration. All of these types of things have been done at, uh, at Hotchkiss. Again, which which really shows the importance of us holding these sites, because as technology improves, as techniques improve, scientists can go back in and and restudy some of these things or pull new data out of the ground and and answer more questions. So quickly, how do we manage all these sites? We use two guides, uh, our general manage, management guidelines. Excuse me. our general management guidelines and our site specific plans. Our general management guideline is just a, as it says, a general guide to how we, we um, manage our, our preserves. It, it applies to all preserves, covers how to apply for a research permit, permitted research procedures, uh, disposition ownership of collections, uh, public education and divestiture, divestiture of a preserve if, if that needs to happen in the future. Site-specific plans are developed for each site specifically, um, and they cover things like security and protection, uh, site access. We we have we we have a policy that uh, we have unrestricted access to Native American tribes to all of our preserves. Um, public education stabilization. Uh, again, each each site is different and might might require um, fencing might require divert water diversion to, to stop hurting a resource, um, all kinds of things. So that's that's where these site-specific plans come into play. Um, it lists previous curation or pre previous research and, and curation and other issues unique to, to the individual site. So how do we pay for all this? And I think most of you already know, mostly, uh, memberships. Three hundred to five hundred dollars memberships, our life membership, our Anasazi Circle membership, uh, which these are always fun. We do a weekend tour uh, once a year when you know things are normal uh, for uh, our Anasazi tour members, and that's always a, a very fun weekend to host. Um, we get gifts of of stocks, bequests. And we are a 501c3, as most of you know, uh, I'm sure all of you know, making a donation, mostly, most donations tax, tax deductible. And our current membership, our membership hovers right around 20,000 members. Uh, each of you get, the member, our members get American Archaeology, but we also sell that magazine. So that, that uh, gives us some revenue. Our expeditions, our great fundraising, our great fundraising, excuse me, fundraising tool. Um, examples are the Yampa River Tour, uh, Machu Picchu, Northern Plains, French and Indian War, Best of the Southwest in New Mexico, or out of New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, and Osaka on the Day of the Dead. One of our typical tour groups, always fun people. Uh, we just we have a blast on our tours. They're they're. Uh, they're very informal, um, flexible. We, we just have a great time. Some more pictures of a tour. This one's our tour out of Chaco Canyon. Um, this one is in Mexico, the Temple of the, of the Feathered Serpent. Serpent, Yeah, just, just great stuff. We have fun. So we need your help to lead us to new, to new site projects. Help fund our work, become a member, which you already are. Thank you. Spread the word. And we do, uh, like I said, we utilize uh, site stewards as monitors. And if you're interested uh, in being a site steward, contact your local regional office and, and express your interest. And with that, that's all I have. I thank you very much.
I have a few questions coming in across chat. Okay. Yeah, I couldn't see them when I was doing the presentation. Oh, no so, worries. So let's see here. Evidence of pigments and cupules. I have not seen that. Like I said, we've seen them in uh, in the bedrock mortars, but not in the cupules. And I don't know if that's because um, more of the cupules are on the the horizontal. I'm sorry, the vertical faces of the rock, um, or if it's just the the different uses of the cupules. D stretch. Yes, we've had. Um, actually, we had at one of our our sites. Well, our only site in Idaho, we had um, a researcher go in and do a bunch of D stretch um, photographs of three caves that are on this property. There are a couple of pictographs that have been documented, but she says she found more, but I haven't seen the official results. And I'm looking to put that in in the magazine, probably in our field notes section with her results, either in um, the the spring issue or the summer issue. Have the human remains been identified, and how are they being handled? So those those sites that I mentioned um, finding human remains. Those were done prior to my time. So I'm sure they were curated. I don't know about them being identified um, as per NAGPRA, if they were in a, a federally funded facility, they have to be handed over. I we I do have one site where we reinterred some, some remains that were removed. Um, the Conservancy has a burial avoidance policy where in the research design, we, we it's more than a suggestion, but, but it's our policy that burials are avoided. Um, other than that, they're handled per uh, federal law. A fish spear would be either bone or a bone, a uh, spear or a, a, a stone spear head that would be, it's instead of like a regular point, like in what is typically known as an arrowhead, it would have more barbs on it. So when it goes into the fish, when it's pulled back, it wouldn't wouldn't come out of the fish, if that makes sense. It's more of a, a longer type of uh, uh, barbed, um, almost like a, what do you call it when you go diving? I'm not a diver. I live in Nevada. Um, the uh, anyway, Hawaiian sling type thing. Anyway, hopefully that makes sense. The thoughts on the cupules having fertility significance um, that just comes from researchers, and um, I think uh, verbal history. Uh, and where these where these are are usually found, they're not in they're not in food processing sites. They're more um, they're they're more away from that. They're they're usually sort of isolated sites. Um, and that that's my take on it. Again, I'm I'm not an archaeologist, but but that's that's kind of the leading theory that that they, they're in these sort of isolated areas where the young women would go and do their fertility rites. And, and actually at Rocky Hill, they're still being done there. How can we arrange a tour of Rocky Hill? Send me an email and I'll get you in touch with Manuel and we'll hopefully get you there. I've never heard of obsidian hydration analysis. Quick explanation. So again, I'm not an archeologist, but so obsidian absorbs water or water at a certain rate. And so say you take a piece of obsidian, you, you chip some of it off. At that point in time, that piece of obsidian is gonna start absorbing water or hydration. So what, What's done is they take, say you find a point, they can take a notch out of that point, 
they can they can analyze the the piece and see how far that the the water or hydration has gone into that that piece of obsidian and by gauging that they can tell how long it's been since that since the the top was chipped off if that makes sense That looks like it. Great. Well, I guess that's the end of our uh, lecture series for 2020. So uh, I hope you guys will stay tuned and we'll be back in 2021. Thanks for coming. <laughs>